We're going to ask you to open up your Bibles again to Luke chapter number 11. And we are, Lord willing, going to continue in our study uh, with uh, the matter of, of prayer. So Luke 11, and we want to look at chapter number 1. And we'll begin with verse 1. We'll go down to verse number 2. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Uh, tonight, uh, we want to go to the Lord in prayer, and I would ask you to pray with me. Uh, Brother Jacob uh, Grinstead, he is at, uh, called Local Church. It's up close to 369. They're having a very large FCA event for the county. And um, the Lord has put Jacob in a good position of, of having some influence uh, across some schools and things. And so there's a guest speaker up there tonight. And so high schools, pretty much almost every public high school will be represented there in some way tonight. Uh, and we're hoping that... Um, this gentleman will take that opportunity to share the gospel. He's got a great opportunity. Uh, and so if you all would just pray with me uh, that the word, we know the word will not return void, so we're just praying that he will share the word uh, because the word will do what the Lord intends for it to do. And uh, so let's, let's do that now. Dear Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, and we do love you and thank you for your mercy and your grace for your kindness, for your perfection, um, for your long-suffering and your willingness to continue to work in the lives of your people. We thank you, Father, that you give us your word, and we're trusting that it would not return void. And so now, Lord, we're praying that you would have your hand upon the gentleman that is speaking to all of those young people across the county tonight, we pray, Father, that you would uh, in, intervene and that he would give your word and that there would be a clear presentation of the gospel and that you, through the power of your spirit, would work and move among those young people and that, Father, many, if not all, would genuinely be born again tonight by the power of your word and your spirit. And Father, we pray that we would be a congregation uh, that could be used of you to help with the furtherance of your kingdom by discipling these young people. And we pray, Lord, that there would be other churches that would properly teach and disciple them. So Lord, we ask that you would intervene in that meeting. And we know that you are uh, everywhere. We know that you are omnipresent. And so, Lord, I'm asking that you would also help us here, that you would speak through me, that, again, your word would be taught and preached here, that you would cause me to say the things that you want me to say and keep me from saying things that I shouldn't, that I would be filled with your spirit, anointed, afresh and anew. Help me now, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. So, we have been uh, going slowly through Luke 11, just like we've been going slowly through Luke 12, uh, and uh, I'm grateful for it. Uh, when we look here in verse 2 of chapter 11, we're looking at what Jesus' first instructions are uh, in this manner of prayer. I think that if Jesus took the time to teach his disciples how to pray, and then the Lord had Luke and others to write it down, then it must be of significance uh, in this matter of prayer. So I think it does matter 
how we pray. I think according to Scripture, it matters what we say. And so when we're looking at this, uh, if there's anything, if we haven't learned anything, I hope that we at least learn this, that it does matter. It matters how we pray, and it matters what we say. And so when we're looking, when we look, the thing that we've talked about, when ye pray, say, our Father. And so we talked in depth about how that it was very important to Jesus that we accept that when we are praying, we are talking to our Father. His Father is our Father. My Heavenly Father is your Heavenly Father. If you are a believer and a part of the family of God, it is a Our Father prayer. This really ties in very well with this morning's lesson as well, that the promise uh, the promises of the kingdom or the promise of the kingdom is legitimately to the flock. So prayer is something that is given, yes, to individuals, but it is also given to us that are a part of the church. Our Father and then which art in heaven. And we looked at that. Why would he say that? Uh, especially since God our Father is everywhere. Well, he is saying that, I believe, because he wants us to know that our Heavenly Father reigns in a place. It is a real place, a literal place. He reigns from a place that is not like this place. And so when we consider, when we're entering into this uh, wonderful thing of prayer, we also get to enter into that place. And uh, we expounded upon that and uh, I would encourage you to go back and take a look at it. When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven. And then last Sunday night, we talked about the word hallowed, the holiness and the reverence that we are supposed to be uh, uh, entering in uh, to this place of prayer. Hallowed be thy name. It is a holy moment. And now tonight, I want us to just look at the word name. Hallowed be thy name. Now, we've got a lot of verses to share with you tonight. I don't know how long that actual projector will keep running, so I hope that you brought your Bibles, or I hope that you've brought a device that you can look up the Scriptures on, because we do. We've got a lot of verses to share with you. So we want to look at this word name, hallowed be thy name. Now, Jesus is telling us that the person or the personage that we are speaking to has a name, all right? And it's easy to pass over this, but it's important that we don't. Uh, to whom are we praying? Uh, when we just look up the word name and we try to get a definition of it, it means a derivative of the base these two, these two Greek words, a name, an authority, a character. Uh, it is a prolonged form of a primary verb to know absolutely. So when the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, hallowed be thy name, he is saying that the name of the personage that we are praying to Number one, they are thy name. It is a personage, but also that, that, that their name reveals to us their character. So that when we know somebody by their name, like, for example, uh, I may literally walk up to someone in town, and because I've been previously introduced Let's say their name is Bob, all right? And so I walk up to Bob and I say, hey, Bob. And Bob is the nickname or the short name for Robert. I might even know that, okay? I might even know that Bob is the short name for Robert. And I might know, I might even be able to go in and look up what the name Robert means. But just because I know Bob as Bob doesn't mean that I know Bob. Does this make sense to you guys? Can y'all relate to that? I don't really know Bob. I know Bob's name. But I may get to know Bob. 
<laughs> is this okay? Yeah. And Jesus Christ is saying to us, we are supposed to be entering into prayer with our Father, our Father. And when we say our Father, it's supposed to have the weight that we know Him absolutely. It's not like knowing Bob. Is this, does that make sense? So we are known by our name, but a name is much more than just something we are called, or at least it should be. When we consider the time and the energy put into the picking of a name. Any parents in here? Did you take time in picking their name of your children? Did you agonize over it maybe a little bit? Did you, did you sit and think, okay, how does... Hannah Elizabeth Grinstead sound. Yes, that's going to be a very long name. But how does it sound? Hannah Elizabeth Grinstead. Rachel Victoria Grinstead. Jacob Isaiah Grinstead. I know that Krista and I, we thought it out. We were concerned about what their names were going to be, how it was going to flow. I think... Almost every parent in here probably did that. I hope you did, or, or your children probably don't like you right now. You know, but no, everybody. And sometimes what we'll do is we'll have some, uh, one of our children will be named after somebody that was important to them. It's interesting. My middle name comes from my father knew a man in his hometown that was, in his opinion, the best carpenter in his hometown. That's where my middle name comes from. I'm named after Henry Clay Davenport. Why would I know that? Why would I know that my middle name comes from Henry Clay Davenport from Chilhowee, Virginia? Because my father had high regard for him as a carpenter. And that's where I got my middle name. You may know the origination of your name. But see, names, according to Scripture, Proverbs 22, 1, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And that just, that, that's not talking about getting a good name that flows well, like um, Luther Vandross or Emilio Estevez. Or, not, not that. No, it's, it's talking about what is behind it, it? This is starting to get more into the character behind the name. So that basically it's talking about the reputation of a person. What people think when they hear your name. What do people think when they hear your name? If someone says your name, the Bible teaches us that it's important that your name means something. And that it means something good so that when, think, when people hear your name. Here's another wonderful passage about a name. Ecclesiastes 7.1. This blesses my heart. A good name is better than precious ointment. So it's good for you to have a good name. It's better for you to have a good name than to have expensive ointment. But the reverse is this too. There can be a spirit about a person. There can be a character about a person. And there can be a spirit about a person that when your name is spoken to them, it immediately brings good thoughts and happy thoughts. So there's, so there's one thing for someone to say your name, and, and when they say your name, they go, oh yes, that is an honest man, honest woman with good character. And then it's even another thing for someone to say the name, uh, your, your name in particular, and for some reason it, it evokes happy emotions, good emotions. A good spirit, it brings about a good spirit in the person because someone mentioned your your name. It's like ointment. This verse is teaching that hearing a person's name can be like medicine that brings comfort. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Consider this verse, if we could bring it on the screen. We'll, we'll keep trying, Miss Ezzy. She's doing a great job. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Neither, listen to this, neither is there salvation in any other 
For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. This is the apostles talking about the name of who? Jesus. Anybody who knows their Bible knows they're talking about Jesus. Anybody who knows their Bible knows, and anybody who knows Jesus, who genuinely knows Jesus, knows that this is true. This is true. You can call upon the name of Jesus and He brings salvation. I called upon the name of Jesus the day I was saved from hell. I called on the name of Jesus the day I was sliding off of a roof. Who saved me from sliding off of that roof? Jesus. Jesus. I called upon the name of Jesus in a moment of spiraling Mentally, I felt like I was spiraling out of control. Things were falling apart. Things were coming undone. And all I could do in that moment was Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And you know what happened? He saved me. There is no other name. You can, you can try. Trust me, if you're falling off a roof, don't say, Christopher Clay Grinstead, you're going to fall off that roof because I'm not coming. I won't even hear you. Is it making sense? In the middle of the night or in the middle of an agony, in the middle of a heartbreak, in the middle of a broken body, in the middle of sickness, sometimes when you are going back into that place known as an operating room and everybody you love, that door swings shut and you go into that operating room all by yourself and right before you go out, you have the capacity, the mental or the emotional, the spiritual capacity, and you know the name that's in the forefront of your mind, you know the name that is upon your lips, whether it comes out of your mouth, it's definitely going on in your heart, and you know who it is, you're saying, Lord Jesus, help me. Am I telling the truth or am I not? Does he come? He does. There is no other name whereby we can be saved. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, rescued, delivered. John 14, 13, And whatsoever ye shall ask, this is Jesus' teaching, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 14, 14. I'll let Ezzy bring up John 15, 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Jesus Christ is, 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 is making great claims about his own name. John 16, 23. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily I... Or verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Here too have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. John 16, 26, at that day ye shall ask in my name. And I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. Here's the, here's the truth. The, the, the wonderful truth is, is we, we know that there is genuinely a name and the person that is ascribed that name lives up to the character of that name. The name Jesus means Savior. When he was going to be named, when, when, when Mary and Joseph were told, name him Jesus, there, there wasn't anybody really in their lineage that, 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 that would have caused them to name him Jesus. And it was odd and weird. Why are you naming him Jesus? Well, but why? Because the definition of his name, and he shall save his people from their sins. The angel said, name him Jesus, and Jesus has lived up to that name. And here's the other part about it. Just like Ecclesiastes says, you can say the name of Jesus, and it's like an ointment. Is that true? I think that's one of the reasons why it, it sickens me. It does. When I hear people use the name of Jesus in vain. It, it angers me sometimes. 
It angers me when I hear people use the word God, the title God, the name God, Elohim, or they don't say it in Hebrew, they just say God. And when people just say God, like, and they do it wrong, and they do it out of context, it, it, it irritates me, it frustrates me. Uh, sometimes it breaks my heart, and i got to confess, sometimes it angers me. Why? Be- because... There is something in the name. Names are important. God throughout Scripture reveals Himself with His name or names. Uh, Here are a few of the names of God used in the Old Testament. I'm going to give them to you. Uh, You probably know them. El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty. El Elyon, the Most High God. Adonai, Lord Master. Yahweh, Lord Jehovah. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my banner. Jehovah Ra, the Lord, my shepherd. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Jehovah Shama, the Lord is there. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteous. Jehovah Mekadish Kim. I have a hard time with that one. The Lord who sanctifies you. El Olam, the everlasting God. Elohim, God, Quana, Jealous, God, Jehovah, Jireh, the Lord will provide, Jehovah, Shalom, the Lord is peace, Jehovah, Saboeth, the Lord of hosts. When you go through the scriptures, there are all, when you see the, the different times that sometimes it's interpreted God, sometimes it's inter- interpreted Lord, there are different uh, versions of scripture that actually use the different names as you're reading. All of these names are God's way of revealing who He is, which, was, which is summed up, if you please, and we'll get to this, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but... All of these different names are summed up when he says, I am that I am. I am is who he calls himself. It's also summed up when he says, I'm the Father, capital F. Psalm 148, 13, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is excellent. Glory is above the earth and heaven. His glory is above the earth and heaven. In the Old Testament times, a name was not only identification, but an identity as well. Many times a special meaning was attached to the name. Names had among, uh, had, uh, among their purposes an explanatory purpose. Uh, This is illustrated for us in the name of Nabal and in the story of Nabal or Nabal. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 25, and the story goes is that King David was passing through an area and this gentleman by the name of Nabal would not uh, allow the king to be refreshed or to be fed or cared for. And then uh, David is passing back through. And look at what uh, 1 Samuel 25, verse 25 says. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal. Now this is Nabal's wife talking here. For as his name is, so is he. See, Nabal, the word, the name Nabal means fool. So Jesus is passing back, or excuse me, David is passing back through and his wife is concerned about what David is going to do to Nabal and, well, she's his wife and his descendants. And she is saying, Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst send. She is saying, the young men that you sent to get refreshments, she's like, I I didn't see them and my husband acted the way that he acted. Now, if you would, please have mercy on us because Nabal is living up to his name. But I'm going to give you the provisions that you've asked for, you see. Throughout Scripture, God reveals Himself to us through His names. When we study these names, 
that he reveals to us in the Bible, we will better understand who God really is. The meanings behind God's names reveal the central personality and nature of the one who bears them. Who is God to you? See, that is, I believe, what the Lord Jesus Christ is trying to get us to when he's teaching us, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let me hurry. Is he your most high God, all-sufficient God, the one? Is he your master? Is he the Lord of peace, the Lord who will provide? Is he your father? We must be careful not to make God an it or a thing to which we pray. He is our Jehovah Ra, the Lord our shepherd. God knows us by our name. Shouldn't we know him by his name? Jesus plainly says, I know, I, I know my sheep. He says, I call them by name. Hallowed be your name. To hallow a thing is to make it holy, to set it apart, to be exalted as being worthy of absolute devotion. When we pray and we're coming into the presence of God, are we coming with this spirit of absolute devotion, with the spirit of that he is truly worthy to be exalted? To hallow the name of God is to regard him with complete devotion and loving admiration. God's name is of the utmost importance. Therefore, we ought to reserve it a position of grave significance in our minds and hearts. We should never take his name lightly. Leviticus twenty two thirty two 32 says, Neither shall ye profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord which hallow you. We should always rejoice. We should always be thinking. When we think about our Father, when we're thinking in these terms, we're, we're entering into... His presence, and, and we ought to consider His name, and we ought to consider that He lives up to His name. And when we say, in Jesus' name, we should take it as we've said before, that it's like when we say, Lord, and we've prayed, and we said, I, you know, Father, I bring these things to you in Jesus' name. Uh, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray, and we say amen, right? What we're doing is we're actually taking the name of Jesus as though we are saying Jesus is going to sign off on this prayer. We're assigning the name of Jesus to the prayer that we just prayed. It does matter, as we started tonight's lesson off, it does matter what we think and what we say and how we pray. Consider Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It says that he leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He leads us in righteous paths for the sake of his name. He has put the reputation of his name at risk if he does not lead us, feed us, and care for us. If we're following him, he's not going to follow, he's not going to, excuse me, if we're following him, he's not going to lead us into any place to where he will not live up to his name. Revelations chapter 311. Revelations chapter 311. Behold, I come quickly.
Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Revelation 3.12, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. We have a promise that he will write his name on those who hold fast to what he has given us. A promise that he'll write his name on us. Years ago, uh, I can remember a preacher saying, God has wrote his name on us like a child writes their name on a toy or like a grown man will write his name on a tool. I've got some tools that I don't want to walk away, and so I've got my name written on those tools, or at least my initials. And so when you come to, down to have a work night and you go over and you pick up this green Ryobi drill and you look at it and you're thinking, oh, that, I think that's my drill. And you turn and you say, oh, wait a minute, the, the name or well, the title, Pastor, is on there. That's, that's not my drill. That's his drill. Well, when we consider this, the name, this name that has been promised to be written on us, this name shows ownership. God has written his name on us, and it shows ownership. But not only that, it shows a warning. The name of God written on us is to extend a warning to anybody who would want to put their hands on us. The name of the Lord is on us and no man will pluck us. Not only are we in his hands, but his name is written on us. There is no one else. There's no one else, church, for those of us that are still with us. There is no one else who has authority over you. No one else has right to you. And yet we live as though we're up for grabs. When we consider the prayer of Jesus, and we're, we're going to walk through this. In John chapter 17, verse 1, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Now look, this is Jesus praying. John 17, 1, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that Thou hast sent me and hast loved them as Thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom Thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which Thou hast given me. For Thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known Thee, but I have known Thee, and these have known that Thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them Thy name." And will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Consider how many times Jesus references the Lord's name. Well, you say, where? I don't see the name. Well, look at it. Verse 1, he calls him Father. Verse 6, he says, I have manifested thy name. Verse 11, he says, Holy Father, keep them through thine own name. Verse 12, I kept them in thy name. Verse 25, verse 26, he says, O righteous Father, and it ends, I have declared unto them thy name. The idea may rise in us 
that we need to be sure that we are calling God by the right name, depending upon what we are requesting or speaking to Him about. And for those who are very analytical, this may be a concern. For those who are tempted, there is a temptation to think that getting His name right is like the secret ingredients to getting what you want. If I'm asking for something, then I call Him Jehovah something, or I call Him El Shaddai something, or I call Him Elohim. And so if you're not careful, we can get, we can get caught up in that. But if we just look at what Jesus calls Him, and if we just look at what Jesus instructed us to call Him, Jesus instructed us to call Him Father. And Jesus called Him Father. And when we look at the prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17, and then we look at His instructions in John chapter, or excuse me, Luke chapter number 11, He is saying you need to call Him our Father. Just as I am referencing Him as Father when I pray, I want you to understand that when you pray, you need to say our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jesus placed huge emphasis on the name of the God of the universe. He's saying, I have done this in thy name. I have done this for thy name. Say, I have shared with them thy name. What is it? Well, I think the issue that you and I have is we have had people in our lives who have carried the title Father. But it wasn't their name. See, this, I hope that you'll let this sink in. I hope that you'll grab a hold of this. See, my earthly dad, his name was John David Grinstead. That was his name. But he was my dad. Jesus Christ is saying, our Father's name is Father. It seems to imply that the name Father encompasses everything. We we alluded to this earlier. But the name Father, when when we comprehend, when we say our Father, we, that name, it is, it is his name. It's not his title. It's his name. What is he? He is the originator. He is the I am. He is the father of of everything. Without him, there is nothing. Do Do we comprehend this? And so when we are saying our father, when we are even thinking, when we're thinking about him properly, we are literally talking to the father. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.12. Earlier in our lesson, we talked about the name, and, it, and we said the, the meaning of the word name is to know absolutely. And I think that this verse here, let me, I'm going to preface it by this. I understand to some degree that the Apostle Paul was just a man. Just like me, flesh and bones. But when you consider how the Lord was working in the life of this man and through the life of this man, when you consider that the majority of the New Testament that you and I read was given through the the instrument of the Apostle Paul, does everyone here understand and realize that? And when you read his life and what he went through, what... What he saw, what he saw God do, what God did in, in, the, in this, this man witnessed it, right? And he wrote of it. And because of that man's life, how many people have been benefited by what God did in this man's life? Countless. You couldn't count them all. Would you agree with that? Well, here's one of the things that I think is key. 
Look at what he says in verse 12 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. You want to know why the Lord used the Apostle Paul? Because the Apostle Paul was not ashamed. He was not ashamed of the gospel. We find that out, right? He was not ashamed of the gospel. He was not ashamed of the brethren. But look at what he goes on to write. For I know whom I have believed. Not what I believed. I know whom I've believed. Our Father. Our Father. Our Father. When we come into this thing of prayer, we are coming into someone's person and someone's presence who can be known. Who cares what you know about God if you don't know God? Well, I know that God, and I know all the names of God. Well, God bless you. But do you know God? Well, how do you know God? How is that relationship? Would you describe it as father? Intimately loving everything that a... Let me say it. If you had a good father, everything that your God, good father was and also everything that your good father wasn't. If you had a bad father, everything that you wished your father was. Everybody okay? That's whom, that's whom he is. That's whom he is. He says, I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Why? For I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded. I am convinced that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I'm persuaded. I'm convinced. The Apostle Paul says, I know whom I have believed. This is the point. We are praying to whom, not a what. He has a name, and his name perfectly fits his character. It is Father with a capital F, signifying a proper noun. Matthew 23, 1. Then Jesus spake to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, Are we there Let's go to Matthew if we can. I'm going to let uh, Esmeralda. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1. I'm not even sure this is in my notes. I added this later, Esmeralda, so I apologize. Matthew 23, verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do, not, but do not yet after their works, for they say and do not. He's telling his, these people, don't, don't be like the Pharisees. Do what they tell you to do, but don't do it the way they do it because they're hypocrites. Verse 4, for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men... They make broad their phylacteries. Those were the leather pouches that they would put on their heads and put on their arms and enlarge the borders of their garments. They would make them flow out and wide. And, and they loved the uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. Matthew 23, 9, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. 
Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. What an interesting statement for Jesus to make. Don't call anybody on your earth, on, on the earth, your father. There's, you've got one father. See, Christ tells his disciples not to address anyone as father on earth. This is because they have a father in heaven, meaning God, Jesus' own father. Jesus does not mean no one may refer to a parent as a father. He is specifically addressing the practice of referring to religious leaders and mentors as father. In any formal or official sense, what's forbidden is an attempt to give one of Jesus' followers a spiritual status above that of others. It's suggested that great teachers or rabbis of the past, along with the patriarchs of Israel, were sometimes called the fathers during Jesus' era. Jesus wants that name and, more importantly, that reverent attitude to be reserved for God alone. Now, you may call your dad, earthly dad, Pops. You may call him Papa. You may call him Dad. You may call him Father. But when it comes to a place where no one else is to set, no one else, there's one place no one else sets there. Let me say it like this, friend, as best as I know how. No one else has that place in your mind. And no one else has that place in your heart. No one else. It's capital F, Father. And when we pray, we're to say, hallowed be thy name. And what is that name? That name is our Father. What are we doing when we're praying? How are we thinking when we're praying? I genuinely believe that Jesus is trying to teach us what we say and how we say it matters. It matters. Father, have mercy upon me in my feeble attempt. I do know that, that I, I'm still struggling with bringing the full weight the wonderfulness of the fact that you are, you're our Father. You're our Father. Our, the, your Spirit in us cries from within us, Abba, Father. I pray, Holy Father, that, that our Spirit would agree with your spirit. Thank you for what you're teaching. Help us, Lord. Help us, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.